How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel. I'm just going over some late night last minute editing for the interview that you're about to see and I just wanted to say that the entire thing is going to be timestamped. I think that Crystal shares so much amazing information about so many different things when it comes to medical school. Needing to write the MCAT multiple times. She wrote seven times in her case. Needing to apply to medical school over and over again before you finally get in. Starting medical school when you're in your 30s and then finally making the switch from a nursing degree and a career in nursing to a career in medicine. So I really hope that you guys like the video feel free to like feel free to leave any comments you have or any questions in the comment section below and uh enjoy hey my name is crystal and i just recently got into the university of british columbia's medical programs i will be starting this summer and i am the class of 2026 i received my acceptance after a decade of applying to medical school so we'll get into that in this video and i am from a really small ontario community uh just kind of outside the own sound area but i've lived all over ontario and i've worked in healthcare for about 15 years and just a bunch of different settings and you know I'm just a really simple country girl at heart I still love doing a bunch of different agricultural based uh, activities and hobbies on the side I'm really into competitive plowing which is a little bit different so yeah that's me I have a lot of people ask me especially this time of year you know Jinluka I've applied once I've applied twice and I haven't gotten into medical school what would you advise that we do or what have other people done in this situation and I think that there's really no one better to answer questions like this than Crystal so we're going to touch on all of that in just a little bit but I do want to hear a little bit more about you if that's okay maybe start off a little bit about what undergrad you did what your working experience has been like so far anything like that well to be honest with you I think kind of to get into like my journey to medicine I have to kind of go back to high school because I was really fortunate to get a co-op placement in high school in an emergency department like the local one in my little town and I remember during that placement that the role of the physician really stood out to me and I was really interested in it and I went home and I talked to my family about it and they were like you know listen Crystal you know no one in our family barely goes to university let alone like become a physician so um, why don't you just kind of start small and go from there and that was kind of their outlook and I took their advice I took a housekeeping job and I worked in uh, hospital housekeeping for about three years and then I transitioned into a PSW role for a couple of years after that. And then I thought, okay, yeah, maybe I'll try nursing. So then I became a registered nurse and I've been doing that for almost a decade now. And really the entire process has been kind of centered around working in healthcare as much as it is going towards medicine. And for me, I did a really feel like I had a shot of getting into med school during my undergraduate studies. I was doing a bachelor's of science in nursing and I did apply for a couple of years back to back like any traditional undergrad would in third and fourth year. And when I didn't receive those acceptances, it was really, really difficult. I ended up actually taking quite a bit of time off from the application process to kind of reevaluate my life, my choices, other career options in healthcare and came back to the process in the last couple of years and finally received an acceptance. Uh, a backstory that most of you probably don't know is that Crystal originally had commented on one of my videos. I think this was when, two years ago or three years ago? And she told me at the time, she said, when I do get into medical school, I'm going to come on and I'll tell everyone about my story. So, so that's really awesome. And I love seeing stuff like that. You applied in third year for the first time. Is that right? Just want to touch over some of the points you just said. And when you applied that first time, what looking back was do you think the issue with that application cycle why didn't it go the way that you were hoping it would yeah so i guess to kind of answer your question i'll say something good that i think i did in third and fourth year of undergrad i think i did use my noggin in the sense that i looked at the schools that were available and i applied to the ones that matched me best as a student and at the time that was the northern ontario school of medicine i didn't have an mcat and i was from a rural remote community i went to school in nipissing university in north bay so it just made sense to apply to awesome and I think that was why I was successful in getting interviews but when it actually came down to reviewing that application I think the most detrimental thing was my actual interview I think applying or and I think basically participating in the MMI now there's like a ton of resources online including from yourself and many other youtubers but at the time there wasn't a lot of information in 2012 and 2013 and I think I just you know nervous energy took over you just say whatever's on your mind you don't really know how to answer the questions it's overwhelming so i think my interview prep could have been a lot better how many times in total did you apply before being accepted this year five times in total yeah. when i received my 
uh, rejection, I guess, letter in my fourth year, that was actually a very dark time because I felt like it just was like my last opportunity to apply, which is not true at all. But at the time I was like, I'm done. I'm just going to be a nurse now. I guess that's, you know, the most I can do, you know, type of thing. And it's not true at all. The stat that we used to hear when I was applying was that even with a fantastic application, the average number of cycles for an applicant in Canada was somewhere between two and three. Even if everything was perfect, just the way the interview process works out and all the different schools you have to apply to. And I'm sure, were you applying as broadly as possible throughout all this? Absolutely not. I was very focused. So I actually, in my third and fourth year of undergrad, I hadn't even wrote my MCAT. And to be honest with you, I think this reflects that I come from a very non-medical family. I didn't even really know what the MCAT was. I wrote my very first MCAT in 2016 and it was horrible because I studied a week before. I didn't understand it at all. I studied like a week before. I didn't know what was happening. It was a very like overwhelming time because it's such a big steep learning curve to get into the medical sphere. And like I said, I came from nursing and I know that seems like that's very close and adjacent to medicine, but there also is this idea in nursing that you, you stay as a nurse, nurse and medicine are separate, nurse, you do what the doctor says. And it just was, it was a lot of learning I had to do on the side and on my own. And thank God for like all the resources online now, cause that made such a big difference for me. How did you start that process? For anyone that maybe has never heard of these things, they're fresh to the situation, where should they begin looking into this stuff? So the major roadblock I feel like I had in my entire medical process was the MCAT. I wrote it a total of seven times. I actually only had one more lifetime right. Um, so I basically was tapped out on the MCAT. And the process to starting that, honestly, I the reason I found out even about it was there was a book. It used to be called So You Want to Be a Doctor A? And it was about like the Canadian medical school, school application process. And this reflects how old I am because we used to get like books in the library to figure out how to do this stuff. So I had that book and it talked about the MCAT and the lady who wrote the book, though it was helpful, she talked about the day of what to expect. It actually did not prepare me at all for what the actual MCAT was because I didn't realize you had to study like weeks before that there was like 500 hours recommended. Actually, I think I even wrote it. I wrote the old MCAT. So before it must've been before 2016 because I, I wrote like the four hour block in the morning, I think. And then when I came back to doing the MCAT years later, I was like, oh my God, this is eight well, hours. This is a whole day. You <laughs> wrote the 20, before 2015 was the old one, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so clearly this is a reflection of how old I am. But yeah, I just didn't know what I was doing. I knew I wanted to go to med school, but this MCAT business was so difficult for me. I think with me financially finding the money to write the MCAT and the time was huge for me. And I watched your last video with Micah in it, who gave his med school journey. And he talked about studying in blocks. And I can't agree with that more. I felt like I only had success on the MCAT when I wrote in a whole block. And when I took like two months off to study. I also think that I did something that is classically wrong. And I feel like other students do this. So it's not just me, but I'm warning you if you're thinking about this, don't do it. I wrote the MCATs three times in one summer. Do not do that. Oh, Crystal. Oh my God. Okay, listen. <laughs> I had to write the MCAT twice myself. They were in different summers. I can't even imagine having to do it three times in one summer. If you don't mind me asking, every time you wrote the MCAT, did you notice like an upward trajectory in your score? Was there burnout? What was your final score too? Maybe we could touch on that. No, it's, it's a really good question. So essentially, I... My very first time I wrote the MCAT was obviously horrible. It was in the old scoring system. So I think I got like eights and then I randomly on the verbal reasoning got like 14. Wow. So I knew I was okay at that. But when I actually went to write it, the new MCAT, um, I found my scores actually were pretty consistent. They were like 498, 499. So I was like, this isn't good enough for anything. This is, you know, especially in Canada. So I, when I finally got that two month off block from my workplace, and I'm so grateful to this day to my employer who let me take a small leave of absence. That's actually extremely difficult to do in nursing is to get a leave of absence because there is a nursing shortage and it's difficult to get breaks. And I uh, actually saw a huge uh, uptrend. All of a sudden I went to 506 and that's where I ended up landing. I 
basically don't have the best scores in the world, but I really shocked myself with the cars. I was able to get to 128 with your excellent coaching. I got 131 on the psych section. I think I got a 125 on the chem and a 124 in the bio. So it was not like I was doing extremely well, but I, I did enough to get through. And I was really fortunate in this application cycle that I, actually UBC, I think kind of overlooked my MCAT scores a little bit in their process because they do generally have a very high threshold to get an interview. What was your what was your GPA like? I know notoriously UBC does have thresholds for GPA as well. Um, it was a it wasn't super high, 3.87. And then I do have a master's degree. So that was obviously helpful when applying to like NOSM and and uh, other schools that take that into account. Got it, got it. Do you think then 3.87 isn't bad. I know students that have, and myself was only a 3.63, so it's much higher than mine. But I know there are many students that apply with 3.9s, 3.98 and above. What oh, else right. application do you think made it particularly strong? Is there anything that you think really made you stand out? Yeah. So when I look at the schools that I consistently got interviews at, um, which honestly, I only ever interviewed at NOSM and then this past year at UBC, I honestly can say that the number one thing that brought my application, I think, to the forefront was my experience as a healthcare professional and as someone who grew up and continues to work in and out of rural and remote communities. At the end of the day, I think our country really does need rural and remote physicians. And I think hearing from applicants that have that experience and that interest and willingness to train in those regions is massive. And so my really big advice to you, if you're listening and watching this video is, if you're from a rural and remote background and you or you and or you work or have close ties, honestly, medicine needs you and wants you. So definitely apply. I actually got into UBC's um, rural and remote pathway. So that's why I was able to qualify with some of my lesser, you know, not as competitive scores. Because when you look at the out of province applicant pool for UBC, it is like this, this huge jump of numbers. And it's really shocking. And I think when they looked at my application and saw that, you know, I've worked, I worked in a First Nations Reserve for a couple of years. I've worked in and out of rural communities for the last five years doing remote OB and emergency and inpatients. It just kind of made a cumulative application of like, yeah, this girl actually might stay in our communities if we train her. I do want to ask you though, being in a position where I'm able to hear from so many students and people asking me my opinions on different undergrads, if there is a fresh undergrad, an 18, 19 year old student going into university for their first time, and they want to know, is a nursing degree a good degree to do as a pre-med degree? Because some people are thinking, you know, because medical school applications are so competitive, maybe I'll start off with nursing and I'll have it as a backup just in case I don't go in. And in your opinion, what do you think about that? This is so difficult to answer because I think it cuts two ways. I don't think it actually prepares you for the MCAT whatsoever. Like that's not gonna be helpful. So if you feel like you really want to do medicine, I, I feel like doing the traditional pre-med degree is probably the way to go. I don't know how to explain it to you, but I feel like when you take the traditional pre-med route too, you're kind of walking the walk and talking the talk every day to set yourself up for that role. Where nursing, you kind of come through it, you come kind of come at it through the back door, if that makes sense. So you're like, oh, I'm very adjacent to medicine, I'm very close, I understand what a CBC INR stat means, and I know what this test or this procedure looks like because I've done it or helped with it. but. I think it makes it very difficult sometimes in applying to medicine because nursing culture doesn't always lend itself to promoting people to go into medicine. And also I think it's like kind of, it's a big step. To, it feels like a bigger step for some reason than if you're already in the pre-med stream and, and working at it. One good thing I will say though, and I'm hoping, I, well, I guess we'll find out when I get into school, I'm hoping nursing, my nurse experience is helpful and pre-med and clerkship years and pre-clerkship years in the sense that, you know, I have an, an idea already of what this looks like because I've cared for that person or I've seen it in real life. So I'm hoping it helps when it comes to content memorization and things like that. For what it's worth, I think that it will. I suspect <laughs> that it will. I've spoken to uh, an individual in my class who came from a nursing background and he was beating us up in terms of test scores in the first year. So I hope that that applies to you too, because yeah. you found it, it was pretty advantageous. But I do I suspected that. I, I do think that the pre-med program, it's pre-med for a reason. They are trying to get you ready for the MCAT and these different hurdles that you have to jump over. Now, I'm gonna take that and now move it over because another question that I've had from students, especially over the age of 
28, 29 is when students will approach me if they're still not in medical school and say that, you know, for example, if I get into medical school at 28, it is a four year degree. And then after that, if I want to do pediatrics, for example, that is, I believe now a five year residency program. So that's another mm -hmm. nine years of training. If, if you get in whenever you do yeah. get in, how does that, does that influence your decision at all to think that I have another nine years to go? So I'm in my early 30s, just for reference, so people know. So yeah, absolutely. I think something like that is a huge consideration, especially like if you want to have kids or a family. I was actually, like I mentioned, I also was interested in the MD-PhD program, which adds another two years onto that training. And I remember speaking to actually a McMaster MD-PhD student, and it's so funny, she's also in her late 30s now, and she was saying, you know, when I applied, I would have done anything to get into this program, but now that I'm here, I almost would do anything to have a family. And it's such a catch 22. I guess the beautiful thing about Canada and what I love about Canada is the family uh, residency program lets you do plus one year. So if you're really interested in doing like a little more peds or OB or merge, you can have that plus one year as a buffer. And I think that's extremely attractive to, to especially someone like me who's older. But you know what? I think at the end of the day, when I sit down and run the numbers of how long I'm able to work in this profession, like if I, even if I graduate around 40, I still can have a solid 20, 25 years in this career. And that's a really long length of time when you look at clinical medicine and, and clinical work. It's long and tiresome and hard. And I think a 20 year career is very honorable and respectable. <laughs> Me trying to give people advice and say, should you start medical school when you're 30? as people have asked me, you can't really ask me that. And no one's gonna be able to answer that except for the person going through it. You have to kind of, it's a gestalt. Take everything together and see what the best decision is for you. I think too, one thing that made this decision easy for me is how long I've been thinking about medicine. So I had my first exposure to medicine at 17 and I wanted to do it. And I now in my thirties still wanting to do it. So I feel like there's, you know, you have to at some point in time listen to yourself and be like, okay, yeah, I really want to do this. I need to make it happen and make time for it and kind of prioritize it with the other things in your life. And yeah, I think I have had some family members be like, oh, your, your finances are going to be all messed up now. But you know what? Like, I feel like I'm living my dream. I'm so excited. I haven't felt this happy about something in many years. It's a big deal for me. And I can't wait to get started. Like if I could move today and start med school, I would. <laughs> oh my gosh. Absolutely. Crystal, thank you so much. I'm just trying to keep my eye on the timer right here. And the experience that you shared with us and your, your different tidbits of, of knowledge here um, are invaluable. I, I, I'm really glad that we were able to sit down and do this. And I'd love to follow up with you at some point in the future. Go have fun in medical school, do what you can, become that pediatrician, and then maybe we'll follow up nine years from now and we'll see what, what you ended up thinking of it, okay? Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Do you have any last bit of information that you want to share with maybe people that watched all the way to the end? You know what? Find yourself a really good mentor, someone to cheer you on, someone to support you, someone to give you all the tidbits. You know, even if it's just a friend of a friend or someone that you've met informally, that can be a huge difference between you pursuing the path and not. Definitely. Definitely. And with that, everyone, thanks so much for stopping by. Please do remember that when, when I do these videos, I'm just trying to share experiences and that's what we're doing here. And some people are going to have really positive experiences like in Crystal's case, and she's so excited to begin myself included. But I also want to say that it's not for everyone. It's, it's clearly not for everyone. And I think what we're sharing here is to explore the different pathways, get involved and see whether or not it's for you. But if it is, I, I wish you all the best of luck. And with that, thank you so much, Crystal and, and everyone take care.